things we've been doing to help our clients. We've left, a, we want to leave a lot of time for the Q and A, just we had a lot of great questions submitted before the, the webinar, um, but definitely feel free uh, right now in your uh, Zoom uh, webinar settings, you can submit questions and upvote the questions you're interested in seeing answered. If for any reason you have technical difficulties, please get in touch with our colleague, Jamie, her email is displayed there on the screen. All right, start with the facts about the GA4 switch, Mark. So you all know, because you're attending this webinar, the Universal Analytics is going away. Uh, some key dates. Uh, so earlier this month on the 1st, uh, Google, they uh, started to create GA4 properties unless you opted out of that manually. Uh, you'll have until the end of June uh, for the current version of uh, analytics, universal analytics to continue to collect new data. Starting July 1st, uh, UA will no longer collect that new data for you. Um, we've been told by Google officially that we will have at least six months, all of us, uh, to continue to access data in universal analytics, uh, but they do make it a point to say that at some point, uh, access will be removed from uh, Universal Analytics properties. A date hasn't been confirmed on this. Uh, we do link that here where Google talks about that, but uh, all the more reason that uh, there's a time sensitivity to figure this out. For those of you who have Google Analytics 360 or have clients that have Google Analytics 360, uh, you do have you did have the ability to extend that deadline until July 1st of 2024. And this just shows the, the pricing of, you know, you've had paid for that privilege or other benefits of uh, GA360. But one of those is the ability to have that extended timeline for the transition. So, Mark, what happens if uh, we do nothing with the with the GA4 migration? Yeah, so if you do nothing. Essentially, you won't have access to any data within GA4. You won't even have a property unless you are looking at the, the kind of like my auto migrated one. But that's not set up uh, really how um, you'd want your business, you know, Google Analytics property to be set up. But if you do nothing, you know, you uh, will just have, uh, or you won't even have any GA4 data and you'll lose your conversion tracking, which is big for anyone who's using Google Ads and they use Google. Uh, analytics imported conversions, you know, any marketing performance data, attribution data, really any any type of traffic uh, reporting will, you know, essentially, you know, go away. Um, and your ability to really track your marketing performance um, will be, you know, really diminished. So uh, for those of you uh, who work in GA, you work with Granular, uh, you help clients of yours, you probably got notifications in platform and by email about auto migration, auto migration and how, you know, last year uh, there were people who uh, thought they would go into Google Analytics and press a button and say, hey, I set up GA4 to, well, no, I got an email from Google saying, if I go through and uh, create this property, I've migrated to GA4. The problem is the comms is a bit uh, confusing on this. And so we wanted to define uh, what they, you could have taken any of these three steps and that means you still would not have auto migrated. So if you have a universal analytics property, but you've not set up the GA4 property uh, in, in the UA property is not opted out of an auto migration setting. A second, let's say you created the GA4 property, but you haven't linked it to the universal analytics property. Google doesn't understand the relationship between those two and they don't consider that migrated either. And lastly, let's say went through the process of creating the GA4 property, you've linked it to the UA property, but if you haven't completed all the steps in the GA4 setup assistant, in Google's eyes, you have not made that uh, migration. I'm not gonna detail all of the specifics. Uh, I'm not gonna go through each of these. We are gonna be following up uh, with this presentation, uh, with, the, with the resources in this presentation and this recording, uh, but these are just some of the common issues that happens uh, with auto migration. So some of this is more technical. Um, definitely happy to talk about this more in the Q&A or in the follow-up. So from our state, from our end, Granular, we felt compelled to create an offering really because 
there was uh, everything we do for our clients is based around being able to drive measurable performance and that our campaigns that we can demonstrate the relationship between the campaigns we're running and the impact it has on our clients' businesses. And uh, analytics is really instrumental because you can't, uh, you can't uh, measure what you can't track and you need to be able to understand what is truth and what's reality in terms of uh, the impact. And with the, the switch to, to GA4, there was just a lot of murkiness in terms of what um, people could trust from the platforms themselves. You know, uh, were people importing conversions from Google Analytics? Were they using the, the Google Ads Pixel? So what it, from us, it really came down to, you know, we had already spent a lot of time in Google Analytics and Google Tag Manager for our clients. Our clients were coming to us and saying, we need help figuring this out because they were getting all this communication. And so we wanted to figure out as cost-effective a uh, uh, package and uh, uh, offering as possible. And so we can talk about this more later, but I mean, that's really the impetus for why we decided to get more involved in uh, the, the GA4 migration. So now we're gonna jump into what is actually changing. So this is a high level, and then we have seven key areas that we really see as changing that um, many of you will see the, the impact, but starting at a high level, Mark, maybe just talk, touch on these. Yeah, sure. So with GA4, they move to essentially an event-based data model. So universal analytics, you may know the term events from universal analytics. Um, you know, it's typically what you create and then you track those events as conversions. Uh, with GA4, everything is an event. Uh, a page view, a screen view, if you're looking at an app, um, a scroll. Um, so when someone scrolls on the page, your predefined events that you set up, your lead form, your purchase, any of that information is defined as an event. Google automatically will set up event tracking for particular actions on the site. And that is really just because they need this information for their data model. So events is your main metric. Everything is an event. It is an event-based data model, um, really. You know, things that you know from universal analytics like bounce rate, those are gone. Bounce rate can't work in the data model. Uh, you know, people say that, you know, a lot of people think that UA is to GA4, you know, migration is just a simple switch, but it's a completely different platform. Uh, it's a completely different data model like I, I spoke about. So things like bounce rate, you kind of have to leave them with UA um, and focus on, on the metrics that uh, Google's really telling you with GA4 is important to look at. So uh, engaged sessions is really their metric. There's defining characteristics on what an engaged session is, which we'll uh, we provide in a slide, but um, really that is your new uh, kind of source of truth on knowing how uh, engaged people are on your site um, when they're you know, spending time on it. Great, and then to build on that, we have in the seven areas we picked out that we really see big changes between universal analytics and GA4. We have a lot more nuanced uh, areas, but these are just the seven we chose to, to call out. So the first is app tracking. So for any of you who have operated, you know, let's say you, you have your main website, but you have an app, an Android app, uh, an iOS app in the past, you would have to have uh, three separate properties and three separate uh, views that all laddered up to the same account. And so it was a lot more difficult to track the user engagement, user journey across all those different experiences under universal analytics. Uh, GA4 takes advantage of the similar measurement model um, as Google Analytics Firebase, where those uh, interactions are captured as events, but now it's unified. So we've got a simple uh, relationship uh, hierarchy chart here to the right just shows within UA, you know, what that would look like. I know that some of the people who are attending with clients who have apps, they have this exact sort of setup in GA4 that all gets unified together. Uh, the second is uh, hit types. This is a big one. So in uh, universal analytics, interactions were captured uh, across many different hit types. So page views, transactions, social interactions, GA4, think of that as uh, events instead. In GA4, they work with event parameters that uh, these are additional 
uh, inputs additional pieces of information about the action that user took. Um, and so some of those event parameters get set automatically, such as the page title, and you can add up to 25 additional event parameters within each event. Um, Mark touched on this. The data models really are so different that uh, Google is saying you can't do a one-to-one -one copy over of existing event logic from UA to G4. Essentially, you have to create new, new logic. And so you see this comparison there. And Mark, maybe you can touch on this a bit more. Yeah. So, uh, you know, event parameters um, are really, if, if you used UA, you know, and you know the term, you know, custom uh, dimensions or a custom definition uh, in universal analytics, that's essentially a way to spend, send a snippet of information uh, of a hit, you know, to Google Analytics. Uh, this is what event parameters are with GA4. So essentially, every event you can send through in a parameter that tracks something in particular that you want to track. Um, you know, uh, there's a whole list of, of things that you can, you know, uh, pass through. Um, but essentially, it's just a way to log an extra bit of information that GA4 wasn't natively pulling in um, to your events. So everything, you know, not to harp on the idea that everything is an event, but, it, you know, uh, these event parameters can be logged at a really more granular level versus the way that they were with universal uh, analytics. So it's uh, it's much smarter the way that this is set up and it allows for a lot more um, kind of customizing um, than UA. So the third area um, in this touches on, uh, this is a bit of a continuation or related to that previous point is, how sessions are calculated. So uh, on the right, in the example I have, this actually is uh, an example from Granular, our own website, showing uh, top three uh, sources of uh, uh, referral sources that drove traffic um, in GA4 compared to Universal Analytics. And you can see there the differences in terms of the, the number of users and sessions just between the two. And so this, is an example, but you'll really see this play out across any of you we worked with to uh, migrate to, to GA4, or those of you who've done this on your own, um, you see this, and there's a, there's a specific reason for this. So essentially in universal analytics, it was a lot more of a binary strict cutoff calculation that was used to determine what a session was. So a session was, uh, you know, the things that, uh, we're, we're seen as ending a session, 30 minutes of inactivity, the clock actually passing midnight, so that resulted in a new session, or new campaign parameters uh, were set. In GA4, the, the session start uh, event generates a session ID, uh, and each subsequent event during the, the sessions are associated. So um, it's, it's a little more fluid, and uh, similar to UA, it will end after 30 minutes of activity, but now that session can carry across into the next day and it's not affected by new campaign parameters. So in, in the above where I talked about the calculation in UA, that first one still uh, maps, but those, uh, those other two, the clock pass and midnight new campaign parameters, uh, those don't cause the, the, the end of the, the session. So um, you're gonna see discrepancies even with how granular we have everything tagged. On our side, you can see here in this example, you're seeing discrepancies in the data. Yeah, and I've, I've, I've taken a look at comparing UA versus GA4 for a lot of clients, and you get a wide range of differences between users and sessions between the two platforms. You know, it's, it's anyway, it's as small as 1% difference, um, you know, but it's as large as you know, 18%. So we'll talk about this in the Q&A, but you know, there's ways that you can kind of, it may, it may be daunting to see these differences and think, how do you compare these? Um, but, you know, there's kind of calculations you can do to convert your, your universal analytics uh, numbers to GA4 for comparison reasons. But one of the biggest things is really that, you know, timeout um, for uh, midnight, you're, you know, you're not affected. That's a, kind of a big thing for, you know, large session, uh, you know, large traffic websites and traffic websites that um, have uh, a lot of, you know, People that may be in foreign countries with the time zone is different. You know, it's 8 a.m. For, for certain people. And uh, so, yeah, 
yeah, you start to see the the real challenges, especially when you're talking hundreds of thousands, millions yeah. of sessions per month that you can really, it, it becomes a nightmare to try and you know, have it apples to apples. And so I think the important thing, what we're telling our clients and what our team is, is telling their clients is you have to really think of these as two different yeah. models. You, you can't it, think of them as, as, as one or a, just a switch. It's really completely different. So it's best just to understand you know, where you're at with UA, you know, move with GA4 and then really build knowledge into that platform. All right, what else is changing? So uh, BigQuery exports are now free. So uh, for those who maybe aren't as familiar as Google, they've really, the, the past five years, have made a really big push into their um, more uh, business to business, uh, data warehousing, data analysis and aggregation tools with uh, Google Cloud, with uh, Google BigQuery, with Data Studio, I'm getting right into Looker, GA4. And so BigQuery is a tool that they're really uh, advocating uh, those who are using um, uh, GA4 to get data out of uh, GA4 using uh, BigQuery. And so in the, in the past, that was actually limited. Uh, those those uh, exports were limited uh, to GA360 properties. Those are now available to all properties within GA4. So this enables you to send those raw events to BigQuery, um, which can then you can query those through uh, SQL. And so um, no cost to that. And um, the there's another slide where we touch on the fact that uh, you know, spoiler alert, GA4 is not going to be that data uh, analysis, data reporting source of truth tool. You're going to have to find a way to get it out of the platform and manipulate the data using some other tool in order to feel comfortable working with the data. That's It's going to feel um, uh, very frustrating, and that's something we've been working with our clients to, to, to address. So um, we talked about this bounce rate and engagement rate. You know, they are very different metrics. And to try and uh, explain this uh, as directly as possible. So, you know, as someone who, you know, I've been, I was using Google Analytics going back to the early 2000s when Urchin was acquired by Google Analytics, you know, going on two decades. I've used it, and for the most part, so the current version of Analytics is Google Analytics 3. It's basically, if you've used Analytics last month, five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it, it has looked very similar. And one of the metrics that has been talked about, used, um, held up as an indicator of how, how good of a quality of a session from a user um, uh, did you get bounce rate was really held up as a metric. And so I know that uh, we got so many questions before the webinar about bounce rate. It's, some, it's almost the first thing that people ask about. Um, and so what Google is really trying to encourage users to uh, to think about, again, there's a, there's a, a glass half full, and glass uh, half empty interpretation of that is they want you to look at a more holistic uh, metric to, to uh, how that user engages with your website where a bounce rate is a lot more uh, binary. Uh, so, you know, bounce rate is essentially the inverse of engagement rate, uh, which is the number of engaged sessions divided by the total number of sessions in a specified uh, uh, time period where engaged session, Google is defining that as the user was on the page for at least 10 seconds and had at least one conversion event. Now there should be an asterisk next to that because in GA4, these are automatically generated conversion events. If you worked in GA4, you hit the little drop down. Um, it could be one of a number of different conversions. It's not necessarily a transaction or a form fill. Um, it could just be scroll depth or engagement or content. So it's either that or at least two uh, page page views. Um, so uh, bounce rate technically exists. Uh, uh, it's calculated differently, and it's not a native metric. There, you can uh, calculate it, and um, you know, in you basically have to to look at things as in GA4 as 
engagement, right? That's, they don't want you to talk about bounce rate. Bounce rate's a thing of the past. It's too myopic of a metric. Um, as someone who spent so much time, you know, marketing, using analytics, that that was a real uh, hurdle buried across. I've gotten comfortable, you know, with this as, you know, again, everything's tied into, um, Google doesn't want us to think about things in this last click direct response model. They're really pushing advertisers and marketers to think about things in terms of the whole user journey and bounce rate was seen as, I guess, a thorn in the side to, to that and people would call that out. Um, you know, they want us to look at an engagement rate. There's some other things we're doing to show a good quality session, but they do not want us to use bounce rate moving forward. Yeah, but, <clears throat> bounce rate, you know, if you think about bounce rate, you know, it's the idea that uh, with universal analytics, bounce rate is defined by if they, you know, open the site and they don't go anywhere past that first page. So you think about it as a bounce, you know, that you throw the ball against the wall, it comes, you know, back. It's, it's the idea that, you know, it goes to a point and it comes back. So with GA4, bounce rate really can exist with this new data model. So engagement, uh, engage session, engagement rate is really your new source of truth. So you can still, you know, define the quality of the sessions on your site. You just got to think about it a little bit differently and look at that engaged session engagement rate. Um, and it's actually much smarter because bounce rate was really just going off of a simple idea. You know, if they viewed the next page and they didn't. That's when you think about all the things that could happen on a page. You know, if they read a blog and then went, oh, this is great, and left, well, then technically that's a, you know, a bounce rate. But if you do it based off of GA4's data model, you know, it's not a bounce rate because they actually did something on the site. They engaged with the site, and it's much smarter uh, in that sense. All right, what is actually changing? Um, Google Tag Manager has never been more important. We've been big fans of uh, Google Tag Manager here at Granular. I will say, uh, so in March, uh, just uh, earlier this week, was seven years here for me at Granular. Uh, prior to Granular, I never used Google Tag Manager before. I got introduced to Google Tag Manager uh, here by uh, our, our founder here, Jordan Meyer. Um, and a lot of marketers were able to get by without Google Tag Manager. We really pushed it uh, over the years because it's it's a lot more of a comprehensive and secure way to uh, manage tags and uh, track conversions, but you could get by without using Google Tag Manager. Essentially, you're not, if, you're, if you're a marketer, you're running campaigns, uh, you're not gonna be able to get by in GA4 without having Google Tag Manager. It used to be you could create a destination page uh, you know, for conversions in GA itself, you're not going to be able to do that in GA4. So all, with all the goals being moving to more event-based, uh, you have to know your way around Tag Manager, having someone on your, on your team that's versed with it, uh, working with uh, someone like Granular. Um, and it's really important if you're running campaigns. If you have a, a simple three-page Wix website, a Squarespace website, yeah, you could get by without it. But Anything more advanced than that, you're probably going to need Google Tag Manager. Yeah, and I think it does a little bit of a disservice to your ability to use you know, your Google Analytics for experience if you're not, you know, allowing yourself to add, you know, event parameters or, or custom events that you, you know, want to track or really are important to your business. Um, you know, if you don't go through Tag Manager, you have to go through the hard code. Uh, and unless you, you know have a developer that understands the the like the syntax and the logic for GA4 is, you know. GTAG hard code, you really uh, are going to struggle. And G, you know, GTM is your kind of your, your bridge for that. Um, and it allows you to just expand on, you know, all of the things that Google Analytics 4 offers you. So it's really you know, imperative that um, you, you understand your tag manager um, and at least how it can help you with GA4. And last point, again, this isn't everything that's changing. We just picked out seven, uh, seven uh, areas where we saw some change um, that were critical, the account structure. So in universal analytics, the account structure had three elements. You have the account, the property, the view. Within GA4, views going away, so you've got the account in the property. That's a pretty big uh, deal for you know, any of you who had to set up uh, Google Analytics, or you have a, a certain way that you go about doing it with lots of different views. 
that's going away with, uh, with GA4. Uh, on top of that, GA4 introduced this new concept called data streams. Um, we uh, included a link. Uh, we're going to include a, a link to a great resource from Google itself. They have their own uh, e-com merchandise store where they give you access to the actual analytics, uh, the, the universal analytics and the GA4 property. And you can look side by side at the, at the data. And one of the areas that um, is super useful if you want to see an example of lots of, uh, uh, of it being set up the proper way when you see data streams is accessing that resource. Um, basically represents the flow from the website or the app to analytics. Um, within UA, that data was collected at the property level with the tracking ID. The G4 collects data at the stream level via a unique data stream. So G4 properties can have up to 50 data streams and a, a, a limit of 30 app data streams. Anything you would add there? Um, I mean, just think about it as, a, as kind of like a container. You have your data streams and then you have your, your one for iOS, Android, and app. Um, it may seem complicated, but it's very easy once you have at least a web data stream created to really organize it. And a lot of your settings are set within that. Um, so it's actually a really nice way to organize it uh, once you kind of get the hang of it and understand that difference. Because it, it's one of the first things you'll notice with, when you migrate to GA4. And it will be a little daunting, but it's really quite a simple process. And I think you'll like it more once you actively kind of use it. And then views going away, um, just think of things at the property level. You know, uh, you can break out data by the property now. So that's kind of one change you'll have to, to really grasp with is, is the idea that views are going away. Our impact by industry. Um, and then, so start with e-commerce. Yeah. Mark, what are the, the big impacts we're seeing? Yeah. Outside? So with uh, how this is impacting e-commerce clients. Sure. So Google Analytics 4 still has the e-commerce reporting uh, it still reports e-commerce just like Universal Analytics did. Universal Analytics had something called enhanced e-commerce, which is essentially in, uh, uh, e-commerce tracking at its full you know, capability. Um, with GA4, they don't have enhanced, uh, and essentially they give you reports within GA4 that allow you to understand product performance. Uh, you know how many people were buying a product when you know if they first viewed it through that kind of funnel. But they have gone away from this really robust internal reporting uh, ability where you could have multiple different reports within Universal Analytics about your e-commerce performance. Now they've really given you a little bit of e-commerce reporting within the UI, and then they've gatekeeped a lot of it into the custom reporting function, which is in Universal uh, GA4. You can build kind of free form reports. Um, or they really want you to data port. They want you to take that data and move it out of uh, GA4 into something like, you know, through BigQuery, uh, into, you know, Looker Studio or directly to Looker Studio or through something like Supermetrics or Funnel, if you know those, and then migrate those over to um, your reporting platform. So they really, you know, going back to this idea, it's, it, they don't want you to really do much data analysis in this. They want you to do data collection and then move that to a better, data analysis you know, platform. So it's siloing a lot more um, and moving that kind of, you know, uh, reporting outside of the platform. And then with lead gen, um, Google Analytics 4 has something called the data threshold. So essentially if your data, you know, the number of sessions or users doesn't hit a quota, they won't even report that because they want to limit the ability for people to uh, pinpoint exact users and tie them back to some type of personalized information. So they have a, a data threshold, and uh, you know you'll notice that with you know if you have small client or small small user volume, you'll struggle sometimes to even have those reported, and it can affect you more if you're doing something called Google Signals, which is turned off by default, but if you turn it on. Uh, to gain more demographic information that can also hinder your ability to report a lot of your users and sessions. Um, and you know, this you really matters for organizations that have lead gen and, and low, uh, you know, lead volume um, or just low web uh, traffic. Um, 
So you, know, you can see this you know, being a little bit of a hindrance to, to, to low level, the low volume clients. So yeah, what do we learn, Mark, with the transitions we've been doing? Because we started uh, early, early last year with this, and we've done quite a few GA4 transitions. Um, what do we learn? Yeah, so really the, the main thing that, that we really learned early on is the data model for GA4 is really it's it's kind of shining star in it. it, it it's event-based data model is much smarter than universal analytics. It's once you understand how it works, it's, I think you'll like it a lot more. I do. Um, but GA4 suffers from many things that are the first things people see is uh, its UI. Its UI is kind of still in its beta and there's still things to change with it. And uh, its analysis capabilities, these are two things that people really look for in the, in the platform. And, and you know, Google's moved away their analysis uh, capability into importing that data somewhere else. And then the UI is, is just different. Um, you'll easily be able to find your traffic report or your pages report, but it's just going to be a little bit, uh, it's going to, you're going to have to turn your brain a little bit to kind of understand uh, what it looks like. Um, but yeah, and then, you know, with Google, everything Google's kind of brought into, you know, auto migration and attempting to help people with the auto migration, they've really just made things more complicated. You know, GA4 has been a thing now for over a year plus, but really this auto migration and the, and the messaging that they brought around auto migration or just assisting people with migration has really only come up, you know, at least in the, the as we see it, past couple of months. So it's very confusing. And now we really only know, you know, how your GA4 is 100% migrated is if you, you know, completed these steps that they've only really defined recently. So um, we've really learned it's a better tool, but Google's not really showing that um, in, uh, in the way that it's currently kind of, you know, messaging about that. So we've, done a, a number of transitions across uh, multiple industries, everything from using standard uh, CRMs like HubSpot and Salesforce to a more complex multi-site uh, organizations, e-commerce, ticket transactions, lead gen, um, across a number of different platforms. Um, Shopify, which I, I think we have a question in the Q&A that talks about that we want to hit on. Um, the, they're really, in, they're the first example we've seen where they've come out with a solution to, to try and help some of their uh, customers who are using uh, the platform to, to figure out GA4 because so much of the communication uh, has been confusing and a lot of people are not technical. Um, one thing I did want to hit on on the previous slide about what we've learned, I would say the big thing is that People didn't realize the extent to which they are customers uh, and, and clients that even if they don't go into Google Analytics every day, there was a comfort level and a familiarity yeah. where you could uh, pull data. You know, if you had to go into a meeting, uh, you knew you were going to um, uh, be going into a meeting or you're putting together a presentation for, for performance. Maybe you weren't bugging your agency partner. You felt like, hey, I don't need to bug my agency partner or someone on my team. I could just quick go in filter some data, throw a screenshot in or export it out. I would say that's probably the areas where the feedback we've gotten, a lot of the frustration and anxiety from our customers because they, with that user interface, they do not have the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and when they say, well, I get it, it just looks a little different. Can I just get the same report I used to get in Universal Analytics? I just want to recreate it in GA4. We have to explain that report doesn't exist in, mm -hmm. in GA4. Um, that's something that uh, we're yeah, working with. All right. Um, oh. And so um, other things that we've uh, learned here, uh, Mark, I'll let you take, yeah. take this one. So really how we how we handle things and how, you know, how was really how we uh, handle a, a transition from our side is is it's full transparency because uh, really we want to make sure that you understand what we're working on, 
Um, and, you know, we won't want to hide this because it can be a brand new and, and often confusing, you know, first, uh, you know, step into G4 for many of you. So uh, the way we kind of handle the migration is every client gets two properties, two GA4 properties. One is for testing. One is for reporting. Really, the testing is to make sure that we QA the data before we send it into a reporting property. That's best practice. I you know, wouldn't want to find an issue with the reporting, uh, the data collection within a reporting property, because then that's going to hinder your ability to use that data when you're you know, looking at retrospective performance or, or anything like that. So every client's given two, you know, uh, essentially they run in tandem, um, reporting and testing. Um, and really, once your reporting property goes live and, and we're finished, really only when I'm working on uh, the site or I'm working in, in Tag Manager on the site, would that traffic then be sent to the testing? Um, and it really, you know, like I said, it, it really helps us debug and QA the, the you know, data without affecting your live you know, website data that we're sending to a reporting property. Um, and then we put together a pretty thorough uh, implementation uh, plan where I audit your, your GTM, I audit your, your universal analytics, and I say, okay, these are your events, and I, you know, we'll send this to you before the migration and you approve it. And essentially, it will define what we want to track within and GA4 and what we're going to be migrating. And that's events, that's settings, that's everything. Um, and that's really just to make sure that you know what we're working on and that what you should expect will be in GA4. And I think that might you know, relieve some stress that knowing, okay, you know, GA4 is going to have my purchase event. It's going to have you know, this uh, you know, request for information lead form. Um, you know, you're going to have that in there. So that's really why we do that. Um, so, yeah. So for those of you who've worked with us, you know what our process has been for the, the GA4 migration. Uh, for those of you who are interested, definitely feel free to get in touch with Granular. You have uh, my contact information. Uh, Marks has shared as well. Jamie, who has been in touch with you, let you know about the webinar. Uh, the engagements we've been doing, again, these are not monthly ongoing, these are one time. We tried to figure out how do we make it as comprehensive and streamlined as possible without um, in, in doing it for uh, as cost effective price as we can. So for very simple standard migrations, we've done those for, you know, in some instances, uh, you know, just a little over $1,000. We've had some others on the, the higher end, very complex multi-website, multi-region, you know, uh, more than 10,000 plus range, but for, for most of our uh, clients that we're working with, we're uh, ending uh, somewhere uh, kind of in, in the middle of that range. And uh, definitely feel free to reach out to us if you have questions. Um, definitely happy to walk you through the process and approach. Um, it's really important for us. Again, we felt we had to do this because the clock has started, data is going to go away, and we want our clients to feel as empowered as possible to have the access to their data and feel comfortable knowing how to use the tool, set it up, know how to get the data that they need so that way they can make decisions. All right, so we are in the Q&A portion now. Um, we have uh, some questions that have already been submitted. Uh, so for those of you who submitted those questions before, we're gonna prioritize those. We had so many questions before, we just had to, we couldn't, uh, we can't cover those all, we wanna answer some of those. Uh, during the, the webinar as well. So I've got a couple of those pulled out and then we're gonna, we've got our colleague Grant Officer Media who's helping uh, produce and run the webinar for us. It looks like there's some questions coming in. I'll have him share those with us. So the first question comes from Tina. It's a multi-parter. Uh, um, let's see, I don't know. Let's see if we can uh, hit, hit this. So starting July, 2023, concern GFO or not, so historical data and understanding J4 may not have Apple established metrics for specifics like segments, goals, and audiences. What is the best way to report on and analyze year over year metrics? Yeah. So uh, I think I touched on this earlier, but because you know your users for J4 will not match your users for, for universal analytics because they're just calculated differently. Um, we can provide this uh, after there's essentially kind of like a, a metric or, or a conversion. Um, calculation that you can do to kind of, uh, you, know, you can put your numbers in Excel and then use this kind of, you know, calculation to translate your universal analytics numbers over to GA4. Um, and then that would help you better compare it because then those numbers are going to be 
kind of translated to you know what GA4 would be. Um, and that gives you a better way to do that. So really the best way I would say um, is don't try to compare them you know, as they stand, really convert those uh, using, you know, the article will, will provide to, to translate those to, you know, GA4 numbers um, and then analyze those um, because, you know, yeah, that's your best way to really, um, you know, do that. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Right. Do we have a shareable cheat sheet matching up? It was that universal now it's this in GA4. So unofficially, we kind of put something like that together here. Could make for a good blog post yeah. or a graphic. Maybe that's something we do is put together a graphic trying to show, you know, it was this in Universal. It's now uh, that in GA4. Uh, we, we touched on that uh, a little bit, but I don't really, we don't have anything off the shelf we can share. Yeah, I mean, some of the ones I think of page views are, are now going to be called, I think, pages and screens or page uh, view and then a, a screen view. Um, so uh, it really depends on, on kind of like how, what is most important to you or at least what you're looking at the most in UA. Um, but yeah, we can certainly, you know, uh, follow up with, with some type of, of cheat sheet. And I know there's Google provides some translation um, between the two within their kind of internal documentation. Yeah, we did reference that uh, official documentation about putting together this presentation. But as I think about it, trying to show it graphically helps. Like, I remember the first time, you know, logging in to, to GA4 and how it shows, you know, page name by default. Mm -hmm. And in uh, Universal Analytics, you never would care about the name of the page. You would look at the URL yeah. slug. So you and have to change it to yeah. page path and screen yeah. class. That was not, that is not common naming convention no. uh, UA. Um, what is the best way to capture historical GA universal data full export for the past X years or are there tools or software solutions? So we touched on this. Uh, we do have a, uh, we are going to be sharing resources after this, um, but you will have the ability to export uh, through a number of different means, CSV, Excel, uh, PDF if you want to do that, BigQuery, export your yeah, universal analytics. But uh, the most effective way, in our opinion, is going to be using the API, using a, a tool like Supermetrics or um, uh, our funnel to, yeah. to do that. Supermetrics has a Google Sheets add-on. Obviously, we we're biased. We'd say the best way to uh, do that is work with us. We'll work with you for a solution that makes sense for your business to figure out the best way to export it. But um, yeah, that's you're going to want to get that data out of there. So for accounts that are currently running G4 in parallel with Universal, how close is the data one to the other? If metrics are significantly off, what are the best troubleshooting steps to take? Um, wait, that is a simple question, but it has a more nuanced answer. So. Yeah, so um, I actually was thinking about this not, not long ago and kind of you know, preparing for this. And, and um, yet you... Google always recommends that you run Universal and GA4 in tandem, and so at least as, as soon as you can in tandem. Uh, and really, the numbers aren't going to uh, match up. And I wouldn't look and say, okay, well, you know, GA4 says 6,000 and this says 4,000. I mean, I, I think I spoke about this earlier, but you know, I looked at UA versus GA4 for sessions and users, and they're you know, sometimes 1% difference, but sometimes 18%. You know, it, there's a range. So uh, I wouldn't look at those and be like, well, UA has this and GA4 has this, there must be something wrong. I would look at trends. So look at your trends day to day for, for Universal. Do you see those similar trends for GA4? If not, there may be an issue in data collection, but if you see those same trends, you know, most likely, uh, you know, um, th that's a fine in kind of way to, to, to kind of like debug it. Um, it, so I would not look at it as if the metrics are off, that being your issue. Look at those trends within GA4. Um, and if the metrics are, are off um, and you and the trend looks off, then you probably have to debug your data collection. Um, and uh, you know that you know that means that your universal was set up correctly. But 
um, I really look at it trends and not on the individual number. Um, and you know, going back to the first question, you can translate those numbers to GA4 if you really want to uh, kind of get a better picture of is there a such a difference that wouldn't make any sense or that you know, maybe something wrong with it. And that's also our you know work to to make sure that you know there isn't data collection issues before we pass that you know um, implementation you know, completion over to you. Cool. Great questions, Tina. I included all four of hers because she was the first one to yeah. submit. So I want to make sure we rewarded uh, getting those questions. And all right, so we have a couple more questions here. And then for those of you who submitted apologies, we we're overwhelmed with the number of uh, questions, which is which is great. Um, but we might have to be a bit brief here and want to follow up um, after the webinar. So this is a question from Dan. So I'm curious on how I can set up specific safe searches for specific analytics questions I may have, such as breakdown in sales by browser device type, or do customers visit our FAQs page or shipping policy page? Be nice to understand enough about GA4 so I can extract those data points myself. So what we would probably recommend you do if you can't, um, if we can't do this through the custom reports builder in GA4 is do this outside of uh GA because they'll just... be able to do that. You'll be able to port your sales data, you know, and 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 add device and be able to look at those and, and really stack those up. Um so you know I would say that my best idea is is to take it out of GA4 and, mm -hmm. and look at it so in you know something like Looker Studio. Um but uh I know one thing that Google offers that is kind of hit or miss but in GA4 they have this search bar at the top and you can kind of ask it almost like AI where you can kind of ask it prompts like, you know, um, sales by device type or something similar to that. And it can assist you in finding a report that would solve that. Or if they can't, they'll give you some type of like documentation or support needs that will um, help you figure out how to look at that. Um, so, um, yeah, I'd say definitely try to port the data out, but uh, look for internal you know, GA4 uh, documentation on, 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 you know, specific use cases, and they should be able to help you. Um, and, you know, um, once you understand the platform enough or start diving in it, I think you'll be able to pull more than than what you, you think, or um, it'll be easier than you think to pull, uh, you know, metrics that you're looking for um, from the actual, you know, inner or uh, UI. I will say Dan's question in a microcosm kind of um, demonstrates one of my big frustrations with this GA4 rollout is so many, Google Analytics is the most successful web uh, analytics tool on the planet and it empowered users who ran websites from advanced to non-technical and everything in between to feel empowered to understand how users engage with their website and it allowed people to understand the behavior of users and the things they could do to influence it. And it was this great dopamine hit you would see as you did certain yeah. things, how do they engage? And so I do not blame people for feeling uh, like, even if you're working with someone like us, if you work with us, um, Dan works with us. So yeah. I know he's a very bright guy, obviously values the agency partnership, but sometimes you want to be able to dive in the data you want at 11 o'clock at yeah, night. You don't want to have to ask someone. And that is the part that, um, you're going to have, we're going to have to, we've been having to help our clients get the data out of Google Analytics uh, for because there's just certain things that aren't going to translate them one to one. Um, I'll, I'll take this question. And again, we've got probably about another 10 minutes here. So uh, this is a question from Melissa. So Shopify, uh, they uh, sent an email a couple of weeks ago saying that uh, they're helping their merchants uh, migrate. Um, how uh, effective is that uh, essentially? Um, so the thing I'll say that Mark and I were talking about um, when we saw this news is if uh, you have a, a vanilla instance of uh, Shopify, very straightforward e-commerce store, um, they Shopify compared to others is trying to make it as helpful as possible to one-to-one -one map it, but Shopify, like any other platform, is not going to know the specific nuances of your business or 
how you use analytics or how you have things set up. So, you know, what we've been having to do for our clients who are on Shopify, we're able to do the migration, you still have to QA it. And you need to make sure that, you know, we understand, we take make a point to understand how are our clients using uh, Shopify and um, how are they using analytics to make sure that it works properly. So as more information come, comes online, as we do more of those migrations with Shopify, we'll uh, communicate on that. Happy to uh, follow up uh, separately with you, uh, Melissa, by email. So this is a question from Ben. Does he need to rewrite his uh, data layer objects for e-commerce custom events? Yeah, so I'm glad uh, this was asked. So um, the so all of, so for anyone who doesn't know, all of your universal data, e-commerce data, NGA four comes out of the site through something called a data layer. Um, it's where all your e-commerce data is sent. Now, will you need to rewrite your data layer objects for GA four? You can use the pre-existing data layer. Uh, for universal analytics, that syntax, you can use that data layer um, for GA4. You just have to map them to, uh, so map the individual data layer events, uh, parameters. You have to map that so it translates to the UI um, or to the logic for, for GA4. Um, I would say don't implement a GA4 data layer until you're probably doing a new site build or, you know, you really want to make that push, but I would say, you know, use UA until you really need to move to uh, GA4 data layer. Um, so yeah. So no, you don't have to. Cool. Thank, thanks, Mark. And I don't know. We have some questions here. We're going to go to with Zoom. Um, should we stop sharing our screen here to keep this up? All right, we'll, we'll keep this up. So um, uh, no particular order. So Nick. Uh, he asked, thanks for attending, Nick makes a client yeah. uh, of ours. Um, if GA4 is not good at analysis, what tool can be used? Uh, we do have a couple resources we referenced in the um, uh, in the presentation, which at the end, I will uh, go to those, but um, Looker Studio, which used to be called uh, Google Data Studio, it's free, it's, it has a relationship with Google. It's easy to use. It's easy to use. That um, uh, is something that I would I would recommend. Um, otherwise, uh, Supermetrics uh, it's a subscription tool. They have a Google Sheets add-on. That's a great uh, tool. They have some pre-built templates in there. And then Funnel works a lot more um, expensive, but very very robust. But I would say for most uh, uh, for for your use case, if you can't use the custom report builder with the GA4, uh, Looker Studio is going to be the way to go. Um, so this question from Max, what's a resource for small website owners? Seems overwhelming to, for a solo site owner to manage. Uh, he has friends who run small hobby stores, dentist therapy offices, people who aren't as tech savvy. If they're not running ads, does it make sense to move them to an alternative uh, data collection analytics platform, even if it's a light monthly cost? Um, we're still going to suggest Google Analytics. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure there of a, of a kind of an option for it. I've you know I've seen different analytics platforms, but G GA4 is still gonna be your best. You know, it's free. Um, you know, for what they're potentially wanting to use it for, uh, you know, it can be a little bit more difficult or or less difficult. It really depends on what they're needing. But uh, you know, the idea of just getting basic tracking on the site, um, you know, without you know any type of events without conversion events, um, that can be done more, you know, simply or simpler, but, uh, so like, I'd still say GA4 is your best option, even if you're not tech savvy, you don't have to necessarily be insanely tech savvy to at bare minimum, get GA4 on the site. You're going to lose out a lot of the features, but, uh, to get base level GA4, it's still pretty simple. Um, Thanks, Mark. All right, we've got um, a couple more questions here. Good, good, good question, Max. And I guess what I'd add to that is, um, I, I estimate, you know, I, I think that there's going to be this gap in the market where people are going to long for the things that we get with Google Analytics, and that GA4 is not going to fill that gap. So there will be some sort of a web analytics tool, either from these platforms themselves or a third party 
that's going to come online at some point. No way to predict, but the, the problem is there's such a large install base and you know, such a familiarity with Google Analytics, it's really hard for someone to come in, but maybe in some specialized scenarios. Um, all right, so this is from uh, someone asking a question for those who have internal staff, would we recommend Google's own resources or training on GA4 or is there external training that you'd recommend instead? So we are in the process of doing, uh, uh, lining up some trainings for clients of ours. Um, there are some uh, resources that Google makes available. They really uh, do have some good resources, but they're pretty technical in nature. I know there's some other organizations that have created courses. We just haven't had a chance to sort through which of those are really effective versus which might be some cash grabs. I don't know. Um, so I know our approach to that. I can't speak to the way that other organizations have done that. Um, let's see. A uh, another question here from Michael, are there currently any options for creating custom channels in GA4? So in UA, you can not only modify the default channels, but you could create additional custom channels for analysis. I believe that's still the case. Um, you should yeah. be able to, to modify those um, and create custom channels uh, to you know really group however you, you want. That hasn't changed. Um, all right, so question from Nico. Have we seen clients use GA4 to populate analytic tools like Site and Group? Sorry. Yeah, right, right here. Have you seen clients use GA4 data to populate analytics tools like Site and Group? So basically, feeding using the you know the, the API using yeah you know, importing data from a GA4 into other um, web you know analytics. Um, properties. I've not straight from GA4 to the platforms. Usually there's like some type of intermediary, you know, tool like Supermetrics or Funnel. That's how I do it. You know, we, we migrate data to other places, but it's always through a funnel or a data aggregation tool because, you know, you can house the data, QA it, and then spit it out. Um, so no, I, I haven't. Uh, it's, you know, um, yeah, I have not. All right. Um, Thanks. And uh, all right, so Ray asks a good question. I don't know if we're going to be able to have time to answer this. Um, uh, I want to make sure that we- There's a lot with the data threshold, which the question is essentially asking about the, the data threshold and how essentially, you know, GA4 accounts can be to held to a data threshold. Um, and there's really no way to necessarily uh, opt out of that. And we can answer that a little bit more and, uh, you know, after. Cool. Um, all right. And then, and then if you can click back to sharing the screen here, Grant. All right. And then just click in the presentation so that way I can toggle. Yep. All right. So I referenced some resources. Um, what we're probably going to do is, you know, for, for those of you attending the webinar or maybe you're watching the recording of this. Uh, we're going to post this to the granular blog. This video is going to be embedded, but we're also going to include links to these resources. So uh, I referenced this earlier. Google does have a demo account you can access that is great if you've not messed around in uh, Google Analytics. And it gives you a link to that demo account for their own uh, merchandise shop. And then it enables you to see side by side the GA4 property, the universal analytics. Yeah, process. that's being our best bet at ability to really look at a large amount of data and really kind of, you know, uh, get your toes wet and kind of see how this works um, when it's, you know, it's not your own data and they have so much in there because it's their actual merchandise store. So it's really your best bet at getting a lot of data and getting e commerce data um, and really understanding how this tool works without you really needing to implement it for yourself yet if you're not ready. We have great resources we link, not just from Granular, but from uh, other uh, websites and resources. So we've got the Granular blog, uh, where we're gonna post this uh, recording and some resources. There's also uh, a great uh, Google Chrome uh, extension, which Mark had turned me onto, which is, which is great, the official uh, dev uh, section of uh, Google's uh, GA4. Uh, part of their website, a couple blogs, and then some tools for data visualization analysis. So we talked about BigQuery, Looker, which used to be called Data Studio, Supermetrics, and uh, Funnel. So these are all tools 
we, you know, we use in love and depending on your organization size or your comfort level, um, they, some or some or all or none of those could be solutions, but um, definitely want to include links to those. I think that's it. So Grant, I, um, in, in closing, wanted to say thank you to all of you who took time to attend. If you're watching recording this, thank you for uh, making it a point to go back and watch this. Um, special thanks first to Mark for you know, helping put this together mm -hmm. and leading the charge mm -hmm. here at Granular uh, with data measurement and working through so many of these migrations. For those of you who've worked with Mark, you know how fantastic he is um, to work with. Um, uh, Grant Nelson, our colleague right off screen here, helping produce this and manage this. Thank you to him. And then our colleague, Jamie, who uh, correspondence with leading up to the webinar. So that is, I think, going to wrap it up here. We are going to be following up uh, with uh, reporting to this webinar and these resources. If you have any questions, if you want to reach out to us directly, I know Mark said, you know, these questions that were asked uh, beforehand and during the webinar, we want to answer yeah. as many of those one-to-one -one as possible. So. Mark's made his mission to try and do that. Yeah. So um, take advantage of that so that we, we can help you. And again, if you think granular can help you out, we're biased, but we think we're pretty good at it. And it's very cost effective and uh, looking forward to being your resource as uh, you navigate this transition. I think we're gonna go ahead and close it out. Thanks everyone. Thank you.